I had my muses. Marilyn Monroe was my muse for award shoes. I don't remember. It's a great I, muse. I mean, I, <laughs> she was before us, you know, but yeah. that picture, some uh, seven year itch with the dress over mm -hmm. the subway grating, voted one of the three most renowned photographs taken in the last century with the Emo Jima flag. And remember the sailor oh, kissing yeah. the nurse in Times Square? Those three, okay? And, and her picture. I said, I would draw a hundred sketches, maybe. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Then when I'm done, I look at them, I look at them, look at them. I would circle the ones I thought Marilyn would wear. And from that came some great, great party shoes. Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitker. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward and discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is produced by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the entrepreneurial journey in fashion. The good decisions, the bad decisions, the tough decisions, the twists and turns and unexpected surprises as we share the legendary story of a legacy in fashion. Today, we're joined by Stuart Weitzman, who has had the wonderful, unique skill of balancing that creative right brain with that businessman left brain. He went from a designer to entrepreneur, building a legacy business that after leg after decades in the industry. Or five decades, actually. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> sold the company to a multi-billion dollar fashion holding company, True Success Story. I'd like to start at the beginning. First of all, welcome, Stuart. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and a nice warm day after New York. This is a pleasure Oh, for well, me. you're welcome to come anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to start kind of at the beginning of your story. You know, you... Um, have a soul rooted in shoes, I guess you could say. Uh, your father being in the business, uh, manufacturing, designing shoes. At what point did you know that this too was your passion? Oh, that, this was not going to be my passion. Oh. I was a, I, my goal was to get into the Wharton School. I did, fortunately. Not sure I would be able today with the standards that these <laughs> kids live up to. Um, and that's, that was my mission. I was going to Wall Street. I was going to break the bank. I uh, interned at Goldman Sachs. I was promised a job when I graduated. They did a lot of recruiting at, at the college I was at. And um, things changed, you know, serendipitously. Sometimes things happen. Yeah. You, uh, and they do to all of us. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes open, everybody, because <laughs> something might be out there in front of you. Just pay attention, and it can change your life for the better. And that happened to me. I was, um, I was a senior. I had a friend who, whose father owned a shoe factory. I didn't know that, but he asked me, he said, can you draw some shoes for my dad? I said, why would, why would I want to do that? He said, well, I saw the designs you draw for the mask and wig. That's our, our theater, like the Hasty Pudding mm. at, at Harvard. A pen has mask and wig. And they're so beautiful, and I'm sure you could draw shoes. I said, well, I never did, but why would I? He said, well, he, he buys designs. He's a shoemaker, but he doesn't, um, he doesn't design himself. He buys freelance. Okay, give me his catalog. I'll see what it looks like. Maybe I can make some ideas that would fit his market. And I drew 20 sketches. I went to his house, gruff kind of guy, calloused hands. He was the shoemaker. You could tell mm -hmm. he was on the machines a lot. Um, and he says, ah, oh, my son tells me you draw shoes. Well, I really don't, but I did. Hope you like some. I laid them out like you might spread a deck of cards and sure. a fan. And he picked one up. And he looked at it and he looked at it and he says, you know, we're medium price here. So occasionally I'll copy something, but I always have to know who it's from. So who'd you copy this from? Nice challenging question. Sure. <laughs> Since I hadn't, it wasn't really a challenge, and I told him that. I looked at your catalog, thought maybe this might be an idea. In fact, I turned to the page and said, that's the shoe that inspired. Oh, he says, okay. Mm -hmm. Put it up to the, to the chandelier over the dining room table we were sitting at. His son is at one end, he's showing, 
He said, I see tracing marks. Now, I know you traced this shoe. So please, who'd you trace it from? Because I do like it. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, if it's a challenge to you to use any of these ideas, because if you're concerned, it's not a problem. And I started to scoop them up. And he tore my sketch up. Just like oh shaking his gosh. head. And he crumbled it and he threw it on the floor. And... Uh, I mean, it was like dead silence, right? 15 seconds or so went by, nothing happened. I don't know what to say. My buddy didn't, his dad, and then his dad picked up another shoe. Looked at the sketch. <laughs> what is he gonna do with this one? <laughs> and he taught me a great lesson. He looked at it, flipped it over, put it on the table, took a pencil out and said, draw it for me again. I couldn't see it, of course, because mm -hmm. he had turned it to the blank side. I sketched it out, boom, boom, boom. Went like this, he looked, he looked, he looked, he saw it was the same. He said, I'll give you 20 bucks a sketch. $380, wheeled off 19 $20 bills. Son of a gun, never paid for the one he tore up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he kept it. Probably scotch taped it back together. My tuition... I'm sorry for whoever hears this, <laughs> was $1,780 at the University of Pennsylvania. A little different wow. today. And he just paid me 380 bucks for an hour's worth That's of sketching, a, yeah. which wasn't even work. It was fun. I sold him $4,000 worth of sketches. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, never told my dad. He paid the tuition. <laughs> and I had fun with that money. Um, and I called Goldman Sachs and I'm going to take a year off. I want to try something. Have a good time. You know, we may not have a chair for you because we're filling them all the right. time, whatever. Never look back. That's how it happened. Oh my gosh, Brett, there's some similar storylines yeah, with I've you been, too. Yeah, I started sketching when I started into retail years well, ago. Things like this happen. Yeah. But you know what really triggered it? That summer, at uh, the end of my senior year, June, I think it was, I was walking on Fifth Avenue. You know where Bergdorf Goodman is? Yes. And on the other corner is Bulgari, 57th and 5th. Bulgari used to be a great shoe store called I. Miller. It was America's premier designer quality shoe chain, 15 stores in the best cities on the best streets. And in the window is this shoe that I said, whoa. And I looked inside, you know, nose up to the window, and I saw the label. It said, D'Antonio, that's the guy I sold my sketches to. He made my shoe. Four colors of it in the best window on Fifth Avenue. When inside, they told me they just placed a reorder for it. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. That convinced me. That's when I called Goldman Sachs. Said, yeah. I'm not going to join you in September. I'm trying something else. So when did you make this leap from designer to was business my, owner? Well, I... Uh, it w I was both at the same time. Okay. I worked for a company for five and a half years. And I picked that company like you'd pick the school you want to go to. Get your education. I wanted a company that was doing what I hoped to do. And they were doing it well. That was my goal. And I interviewed about 10 companies. They thought I was being interviewed by them. Yes. But I was really interviewing them. And I picked one. And he said, you know, we're not ready to start a whole new division. It's a lot of money, it's this and that. And I made it easy for him. I said, you don't have to pay me. I'll do it. Give me two years. A few bucks a week to, so I can eat. My mm -hmm. wife's salary will cover rent and everything. Give me, that's it. Won't cost you anything. I want 8% of whatever volume I can create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's when I, be, I really became, you know, I didn't own it. But at 8% of the gross, yeah, that's, that's so much more than whatever sure. the profit margin would have been if I owned it, that um, I became an owner in, my cre in the creation of the business, really. Confidence I left set it, for a new I designer. I left in six years with uh, too much money to do anything else with but start a company. And I started it. I took three great people mm -hmm. from the firm I worked with. That's a lesson for everybody. You know yeah. what I got out of working for them? Forget about graduate school. If you have a specific career goal in mind, forget it. Mm -hmm. I met three people who I took with me. It would have taken me, every business professor I speak to said that would take you five to 10 years to find three great people and you'd go through two or three before you finally right. had one. And each of these people stayed with me the whole journey and mm -hmm. retired when I sold the company. Um, I learned 
I met every retailer in North America that I someday would hope to sell shoes to with a nice relationship because I was selling them through this other, through the division of this company. And I had a nice relationship with them. We had a good product, so things were going well. I met the factories to make shoes for me. I met tanneries to buy leather. For, I did, I had such a knowledge. When I started up my company, it wasn't really a startup, although yeah. it was a startup, but it wasn't. That's a and you know, when you start small, you do everything. Mm -hmm. So I stayed on as CEO. I didn't need to hire anyone. And I was the creative director. There were only three employees other than those three people I took with me. There were six of us. You can do it all. And it begin, began to grow little by little. And when things grow little by little, you, uh, the management of it, you adjust to. You don't even notice. It's not like I doubled and I needed seven new heads, you know, to help me. It grew 10%, 12%, 8%, 15% was a big deal. And after about seven years, wow, you, you compound those percentages, we're, we're, got a, we're running a company. Yeah. And I never hired anyone to do it till the last five years of the business when I started to look for what to do for its future. Mm. My kids didn't want to come in. I had to find a home. So I needed to spend some time also researching who I should place this company with. Right. And I did. I, uh, I, I could have sold it to a wonderful firm here in, in St. Louis called uh, Calaris. Oh, sure. They offered the highest price. I decided it wasn't about the money, and I took tapestry, which was 20% less. We're talking a lot of money, that 20%. Mm -hmm. So Sycamore was not a happy camper. They were the people who were in it with me after I, re I bought it back from the Jones Group. So uh, what they was, wanted the money. Where, that's where did that, you thing. were you were weighing that decision. You were getting offers. You were, you know, uh, um, Calaris, well-known company yeah. that uh, that features a, a wide variety of, of brands that trend, are, trend yeah. forward brands. Um, what led to some of the decisions for you to select Tapestry over some of the other offers you had on the table? The CEO was a super salesman. He really knew how to sell what that company could do. But the reason I pushed Tapestry to begin with was, they weren't Tapestry then, they were just Coach, because they hadn't mm -hmm. yet bought uh, Kate Spade either. And they were number one in medium price handbags in North America. Mm -hmm. They they were, Michael Kors came on like gang, but they were still doing more business than Michael Kors. In the end, now they're eating their competition because they, they're gonna be buying Michael Kors, the Capri company. Um, and I thought if they could be that good in a similar product, then they have the makings to run Stuart Weitzman. Mm -hmm. I just assumed that that was a logical sequence. I have to acknowledge it wasn't. I found out within six months that corporate management and entrepreneurial management mm -hmm. Yes. Live on two different planets. They, that was true. one of the big questions. Totally yeah. two different planets. Yeah. They should not buy businesses like mine. Yeah. They shouldn't. Yeah, because your business is, um, is uh, this inspiration is at the heart of it. It's not a job. Mm -hmm. You know, when they, when they were negotiating the price, the fellow said to me, we're going to have to hold back 10%, maybe 5%. I, we have to figure it out. I said, well, for what? He says, for severance pay, your average employee has been with you 23 years. Ours is six. We budget oh for six year severance payout. Oh, wow. We don't budget for it four times that. So if that we. That had have, to be a little bit of a red flag for you. Well, I said to him, actually, you should pay me more. Yeah. You know the experience these people have? Yeah. He says, well, you know, they don't adjust to a corporate setting and we don't, you know, which are. History is that they're going to fly the coop or we're going to think they're not the right. So it's going to cost us a lot. I said, you forget it. I said, I'm not, I'm not even going to consider that. You want to add some money to it because of the experience? I'll talk to you, but otherwise. Anyway, they let it drop. But that, that opened my eyes. I didn't realize that these people were with me longer than the normal amount of time. They were with me. Like, you know, like my kids are with me. Like my wife is with me. My friends, they were part of the family. And at companies like Coach, not all of them, there are some great examples of people taking over small entrepreneurial and making them bigger, but these people did not have that attitude. And in fact, they bought Kate Spade. Mm -hmm. 
Two years ago, in the last quarter, comparable, Kate Spade did 400 million. Right. This quarter, they did 246 million. Two years Yeah, later. there's a cost to cutting that heart out, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but anyway, I don't know that Calaris would have done better for us, but I based it on logical reasoning. Coach was a great brand in a product that is in our industry. So the, you know, there's stories everywhere where designers make these difficult decisions to leverage an equity group to help grow their brand. Yeah. And in the end, they kind of lose their name. They lose the identity. Mm-hmm. You know, well, all these things the change. They lose the DNA. They, they lose they, sometimes the DNA too. Well, and that's what they lose. That's how did you manage to control this through these acquisitions? I always ran it. Okay. The deal was I continued to run it till they end 100%. Even when I finally sold it all with ta- with Sycamore, Sycamore sold it all to Tapestry. Um, I was still the CEO for two years. First year totally, second year at helping the new person to replace me, and two years chairman emeritus after that. But we know that's just a nice title. Uh, so I, I kept on with it to teach them what we do, and uh, they. Let me tell you something. They are company like that, not necessarily Tapestry. I had six in my design group. I was the creative director and I did half the designing and the other half got spread out. Um, plus the, the what we call the merchandiser who mm-hmm. helps us make wonderful themes out of what we're doing. Two analysts. How about corporations doing what I'm doing? Two designers, 10 analysts. Hmm. What does that tell you? Yeah. Yeah. What's important to them? The numbers. It's not the product as right. much. That CEO who sold me on coming to coach came to Spain to force the factories to make the shoes for less money, which I never, ever did because I never wanted to take a penny out of the quality of the product. And he said to them, Listen, you've had your little paradise with Stuart. It now has to get more serious. We can make these shoes in Vietnam if we want to. I, in my opinion, not true. That's what he said, but it was a threat, obviously. Yeah. So you've got to work out the prices we're going to give you, not the prices you tell us they cost. Yeah. I would never say that. If I loved the factory's quality, I had to figure out how to design shoes that could carry the final retail price of that quality. Right. I didn't say to them, I need this retail price. You got to downgrade to meet it. That, that's not what they did. Mm-hmm. So why would I do that? And when I needed lower priced products like ballerinas, and mm-hmm. slippers and things like that, flip flop, I found factories that make that as well as it can be made and not to make it cheaper to compete, say, with Javianas. I mean, I, that yeah. wasn't my world. But they don't think that way. We have similar conversations, you know, with, with our clients, you know, having an understanding of transparency of the end product and what you want and how to design into that product where you know the quality that you know you want to get at the price. Yeah, first you have to define your market. Y- yes. Yeah. Then you design, you know, design into it. And if you can't come up with enough looks that get you that price, then you have to redefine your market. I mean, I used to, my competitors in every article would be Jimmy Choo, Mm -hmm. even though he was a little more expensive than me, Blahnik. Not as comfortable as you. That's not, you know, we all had our thing. (laughs) Louboutin isn't as comfortable, but he's the only rock star our industry ever had. I have to acknowledge that. I admire what he's done. Uh, It's amazing, especially when, he doesn't care how it feels on your foot. He cares mm-hmm. how it looks, and he's so good at it that that overcompensates. He's the only one who can get away with that because he's mm-hmm. so good at it. But those were the people we were compared to. Mm-hmm. When someone, when there was a sale, it would be Stuart Weitzman, Jimmy Chu, uh, Manolo Blahnik, Gucci. Now it's Stuart Weitzman, Tory Burch, Cole Haan. So, yeah. so they they can't stay in that market. So they have to readjust to a different market. 
And um, I don't know that that's a good philosophy, but I don't run that company, so it's, it's, and it's not my business anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Although it is strange to be Stuart Weitzman and not own your name. That, that is. I will say, that's strange. <laughs> We've talked to a lot of designers that have been down that path. And, yeah. My, yeah. my uh, someone who works for us in the house, Hispanic, said to me the, the day of, uh, a week after the Wall Street Journal headlines and the business editors, uh, coached by Stuart Weitzman for such and such, you know, money. Uh, and, uh, she said to me, well, she said in Espanol, yo hablo Espanol, she said, uh, you, um, you sold your name <laughs> at your shoes? <laughs> yeah, I sold your name. She says, de hoy en adelante te llamo X. From t now, from today and forward, I call you X. That's hilarious. <laughs> and my kids so thought funny. that was so funny for like a month they were calling me. Hey, Daddy X, what are we going to do today? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, you, you found early on your specialty of um, this, this space that's becoming more popular now, but I think you were very early to the industry of affordable luxury, yeah. you know, creating a product. That's the niche that, I went after. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, bringing quality um, together, comfort, and, and a very chic style. Um, was this just kind of an inherent decision? Did you do research that came into this? Let me say, you this? came close when you said inherent. Okay. How about inherited? My dad had a house on a wonderful block on, in a town in Long Island, and it was probably the most modest house on the block. And none of the houses were not mo you know, modest enough, but it was the most modest. And when we moved, after we were all in college, he sold it. And he was so excited about the price he got. And he said, let me tell you, son. He said, I came to this block. I couldn't build a house that you saw three, four, five down. So I built one as close as I could. But I knew because of the neighborhood I was in and the association of where I was that it would be worth more in the end. Hmm. And if I go into a Saks Fifth Avenue shoe salon, as the opening price point of luxury. Mm -hmm. Well, the women who walk on that floor know they're buying expensive footwear. And if you've got 15 brands at six to $1,200 and I'm at 450 to six, they didn't pick me up off a table because I'm 450 to six. They're in there knowing they're gonna spend 600 to 1200. Mm -hmm. They just know it because that's 80% or 90% of their stock. Um, and then when they, they buy ours, well, our average sale per, per purchase was 1.8 pair of shoes. The average sale wow. in that salon is 1.2. Okay. So what, do we, what, what all that did was help me sell more units to the same woman because she could afford to buy more units. And occasionally, once a year maybe, a Nine West customer would buy one pair of our shoes. Mm -hmm. Now that Nine West customer, a good proportion of them are not gonna be Nine West customers all their lives. Right. They're gonna get a better job. They're gonna marry into a, a well-off family. And they're not gonna be Nine West. They may be, be now be Stuart Weitzman customers, but not once a year, three times a year. Mm -hmm. So it's a real strategy to enter the best marketplace at the easiest supportive price. And that was always a goal of mine. That's why I bought the factories. I didn't want intermediaries. And you know a lot about intermediaries because you act as one. But I bought the factories. And I bought them so that there was no question about what price I was paying. Whatever the cost was, I always had a Spanish partner. They ran it. They weren't part of the Stuart Weitzman umbrella, but they were part of our manufacturing and they had their own comp company for the factory. And uh, they got their 5% guaranteed. They knew they weren't going to lose. They knew sometimes they made a little more because we're reorders and business built up, but they were guaranteed 5%. And if I wanted $6 a square foot leather and the price had originally been based at four, I paid the extra two. They didn't worry and you know, pretend they were buying the six and telling me it was, but it wasn't. It didn't matter to them. They liked when I raised the price because it's 5% of the total cost, right? So right. They, they make more. Uh, that was the way I worked with them. And we got the shoes, I would say 20 to 25% less than they would have cost 
in to a retailer in any other line we competed with because we made our own shoes. Yeah. Sounds like some... Cool. Ferragamo does that as yeah. well, Yeah, by the way. you re really did have a very good strategic business approach. I, I'm curious, you know, you, you did go through periods of selling your company, reacquisition and so forth. And it, in, in the era where you noticed that numbers became the core focus and there's higher negotiation with your factories, uh, factory partners, did you, did you see your sales decline as different decisions were made no, about no, your product no, no, or no, no, no. did they? First of all, I didn't negotiate. I, they had their profit margin. Okay. The negotiation was from me. I negotiated against myself. Did I want that series of ankle straps to sell at four ninety five or five fifty? Mm -hmm. okay. What material am I going to put in it? They didn't care. They were getting their five percent. So I never had to chisel them. Let's say you know as right. you know, as, as Seventh Avenue used to do when it mm -hmm. existed. Yeah, it, sure. it wasn't that kind of business. Not like the CEO of. Tapestry, That's, who went over there and said, right. you know, we can make these in Vietnam for eight euros less. You better become competitive. Did right. that have an impact on the company when that happened? Sadly, yeah. yeah. Is that what led you to, I mean, you've, you, as I mentioned, you've kind of bought and sold, bought and sold, bought and sold, you know. For different but, reasons. Okay. You know. What What was um, some of the core reasons that brought you back to reacquire your company? Well, they weren't doing the job. Yeah. And I wanted a, a, a lifetime of, of existence for Stuart Weitzman. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't want to end with me. You know, you hope it goes on. Some do, some don't. Fashion world, there are a lot of names that used to be there that aren't there today. When I started in this industry, Charles Jordan was king. Kids today don't know who Charles Jordan That's was. Correct. You right. could not get shelf space in a store that had Charles Jordan. You couldn't knock him off a shelf. Mm -hmm. It was that good. Like you can't knock Louboutin or me in a certain mm -hmm. type of product. Um, he was the king. Who ever heard of Charles Duran today? I mentioned I. Miller in New York. Mm -hmm. They had their factories in Pennsylvania and they had their stores in the key cities. No one could compete with them. They're gone. Because fashion, I won't say it's fickle, although it is, but it's the customer who changes. Mm. Look at the casual wear today right. that has extended to footwear. 70% of all shoes are sneaker or sneaker oriented. 70%. Wow. Used to be 15, maybe 20. And that, that counted athletic, real athletic. When I say 70, I'm not talking playing tennis in tennis shoes. Right. I'm talking about shoes you wear that are modeled off of sneaker type looks. And wow. you get a new company like uh, this one in Switzerland that Federer has an interest in, ONCs, that the ON uh, yes. OC. Mm -hmm. From nowhere, seven years ago, to three or four billion dollars. Amazing. That's the power of the sneaker. So what that does to footwear like you're wearing, mm -hmm. smaller market, less people like you who want to dress up that way and make a statement with your shoes. That's what puts people out. I yeah. think more than um, the, the fickleness of fashion. They can't keep up with the changes. Yeah. And I, I developed a philosophy very early on. I would recommend it to any company. A certain percentage can be revolutionary. But a major <laughs> percentage has to be evolution. Oh my God. So this is a this is a mantra at Stars and it's been from the very beginning. Well, it's absolutely evolution, true. not revolution. I used to be I used to be 85, 15, 80, 20. We're now 70, 30. Mm -hmm. um, it ain't ever getting 50, 50 because my gosh, you didn't buy that shoe because of the brand. You bought that shoe because it has an attitude. It right. has a look. And you don't even live in New York where on the subway that would be a good protective shoe for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. 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 With those spikes, spikes sticking on the sole, yes. Right. You bought it because of the attitude. So if someone else makes a hot shoe next year, you don't even remember who the heck that brand was. You're going to the shoe, not the brand. Um, that's why you need at least 70% evolutionary. Yes. Revolutions are bloody, so you always want to be evolving. Yeah. yeah. But the revolutionary designs lead to that kind yeah, of shoe like, for sure. like you're wearing. Yeah. Uh, without them, we're not freshing up. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. I, if I make, you know, uh, 30 or 40 
in our, for Stuart Weitzman, outrageous shoes. And three, start an attitude for me. Oh boy, was that successful. But if I don't do the 30 or 40, I'll never get the three or four. Right. So I do. Um, you know, you've, you've been in the game for, as we said, decades, 60 years or give or 50, take, right? 50. Okay, 50. 46 um, in my company and five with someone else. Okay, okay. So 50 is <laughs> still a, a, a grand period of time. Um, you know, in this thought philosophy of evolution, not revolution, and, and this business of fashion, how have you, um, year after year, remained relevant and what what is your resource for um, inspiring your evolution well um you're probably gonna like this first answer i had 71 managers in my company when i when we finally mm. planted it with coach uh, i say managers that's anyone who has someone working under them okay. store manager sales manager my finance man etc um 71 were women. Okay. That wasn't by accident. Who am I selling? Right. right. And I, I'm, I'm really uh, not naive enough to think I know the best shoes that I design. So I wanted women around me. And first we hire smart and intelligent and nice and competitive communicative, right? Those are the four characteristics we have to have before anything else. But if that happens to be a cool girl who will really understand the fashion shoes, she gets the job. Mm -hmm. Or a lawyer-like woman who is in smart classic shoes, she gets the job for that category. Mm -hmm. And they're not working in that category, but they're muses, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Or they're focus groups so to speak, for me. So that's what those 71 women did. I got very lucky with the first one. She was a superstar for me for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have done what I did without her. The only person ever worked for me, I could have to say, couldn't have done all that I did without this woman. Um, so that was a, a mission. Now, after that, I need inspiration, right? right. We all need inspiration. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I said this uh, at, at one of my, at my recent talk, I think I said at Washington U. One of the mantras I've grabbed onto, which is a quote from Picasso, he was asked in an interview, Senor Picasso, do you ever copy? I don't think he hesitated two seconds. Of course I copy. Yes, I copy. I copy from poets, mm. from musicians from artists, other artists, from nature. So what was he saying? Yeah. Not copy the way Webster would define it. Those were inspirational sources for things he did. Um, more so for me. I have so many industries that can inspire me from architecture. You know, if you think about a fountain pen, Someone designed that fountain pen, mm -hmm. right? Whether it was Peretti with that cute curve on the hook, uh, someone designed it. And if you bear that in mind, when you look at anything, the tripod, maybe there's something that was done that's inspirational for you. Um, I don't mean make a heel like a tripod, right. but maybe, maybe the attachments in it in the middle of a stiletto heel, would, would, if they were rhinestone. There's something you can get usually out of a great design. So I use that for inspiration. This is a very surprising tool. I doubt that if, if there, there are others who use it, I don't know it. Everyone looks in their own industry, especially at their competitors. Right. I don't, and I'll tell you why I don't. If I'm inspired by a competitor, someone is gonna notice that my inspiration was inspired by this guy's great shoe because we're in the same industry. Yeah. And that, you know, that bushel of apples, if there's a bad one, it ruins them all. Yeah. And no one wants to be said, oh, oh, that was a great shoe from, uh, you know, from John Vito Rossi. Um, not a bad idea to make something like it. That's not a compliment, mm -hmm. it's a knife in the heart. So I, I didn't 
I didn't follow them for inspiration. Of course, I wanted to know what they're doing, but not for inspiration. You know who I looked at in my industry? Doc mm. Martin. Oh. And that shoe. You know the shoe I'm talking yes. about? 70 years. I bought a pair. It sat on my desk for years. As it, it was my heritage, my, my love of his, of whatever that shoe meant. I respected it. Mm. And eventually, when I started to see college girls wearing it, not just high school girls, I thought I have to make something like that for my ladies. Yeah. I have to make a hiking boot that they would be, feel cool in. And I have to, you know, I had to get the right person to show it to the public. So I had Kate Moss. Couldn't oh, get more yes. right than Kate Moss, right? I got Kate and she loved it. Now, if she didn't love it, then I didn't have the right shoe because mm -hmm. I was after that attitude. She loved it. In fact, she said to me, when your shoe with the, through with the photo shoot, what do you do with these shoes? <laughs> said, they go in our wardrobe. We loan them out to magazines for hopefully for credit shoes. If you don't need this pair in black, I'd love to have it. Whoa. Oh, there that you go. told me. Yeah. yeah. The next year, the nicest compliment I ever got. I really, I can't think of a better compliment. Chanel put the hiking boot in their line. Oh yeah. And it has been in it ever since. And there isn't a shoe company today that doesn't have a hiking boot. You're That's right. right. And yeah. not Doc Martin hiking boot. Stuart yeah. Weitzman inspired. Nike. Yeah. So I looked outside of the industry for that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, my thigh high boot. Yes. You know about the thigh of high course. boot. Of course. Yeah. I'm sure it would look great on you, by the way. <laughs> I will have to add it to my uh, wish list. <laughs> um, we all know Pretty Woman. Of yep. course. It's the Cinderella story, right? Yes. And even the kids in, who I talked to last night, they, everyone has seen Pretty Woman, even mm -hmm. though it was made it before they were born. Okay. So Julia Roberts is in this black patent leather, thigh high, pointed toe, stiletto heel boot. It's mm -hmm. her working uniform. Yes. Why do these girls who have only one product to sell all wear thigh high boots? I kept what is it about that boot? Now, I'm not a girl, I don't know, but there's gotta be, there's something about that boot. That's their wardrobe. And Julia then wears it in this movie. And her friend had it in red. And I'm thinking, oh man, someday. Anyway, maybe 10 years later, 15 years later, 12 years later, you gals are all wearing leggings. Yeah. That's all you're wearing. Right. Big white shirt from your daddy over your leggings, mm -hmm. like you're walking around in your underwear. Honestly, that's what the guys you said, hey, she's out in her underwear again. It's comfortable. <laughs> in her leggings and a big white shirt. I thought, whoa, if I can make a boot that hugs like that legging, number one, the gals are used to that attitude, that look because of the leggings. Number two, no one else ever did it. And I worked with DuPont and created a Lycra that stretched one way and could adhere to suede. And then we made the suede in a certain way that it stretched with the lycra, but then stretched back. So it didn't stand out there like a saggy sock, right? And I made a pair for Julia, for um, Angelina Jolie. And I made this pair for her because she said to me, I don't know if I want one of those boots. Every boot I buy is like a sock on my leg. Because it always falls down my, she's skinny, skinny leg. I said, I have style, I want to try on you. I want to, we're just getting going with it. And I made her this boot. She called up and said, how many colors does this come in? <laughs> All day long I wore it, it hasn't dropped an inch. It has a drawstring mm -hmm. at the top that you tie in the back so it doesn't hurt the look that you see. Right. And once it's tied, elasticized, it's there for good. Um, my assistant, who became a partner, the one I told you about, who helped me build the business. Her leg is a normal leg. I put it on her, fit great too. Amazing. We had an employee, it was a little, you know, we now call them athletic legs, right? Mm -hmm. Fit her also. Wow. Said, oh my gosh, I have not just got a great style, I got a functional boot that, and, and it became the number one footwear product in the industry that first year. People Magazine did a whole article on it, and at the top was the headline, we believe Stuart Weitzman created this boot. 
and then they talked about how it would be worn, what it could be used with, showed pictures of the celebrities and other gals in it. Um, and that was inspired by yeah. the girls on the street corner. What can Amazing. I tell you? Amazing. You have to keep your eyes open yes. for, what's, for what's going on. You never know where it comes. So that's how you stay ahead. You, you get inspired. And if you want to stay ahead of your competition or different than your competition, let's say different, don't be inspired the same way they are. Look for other people. Yeah. I had my muses. Marilyn Monroe was my muse for award shoes. I don't remember. It's a great I, muse. I mean, I, <laughs> she was before us, you know, but yeah. that picture, some uh, seven year itch with the dress over mm -hmm. the subway grating, voted one of the three most renowned photographs taken in the last century with the Emo Jima flag. And mm -hmm. remember the sailor oh, kissing yeah. the of nurse course. in Times Square? Those three, okay? And, and her picture. I said, I would draw a hundred sketches, maybe. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Then when I'm done, I look at them, I look at them, look at them. I would circle the ones I thought Marilyn would wear. And from that came some great, great party shoes. Um, I did the same thing with Audrey Hepburn and Jackie Kennedy. Mm. Those were two ladies who didn't need a heel to make a statement. Right. Flat, chic, they were so confident in everything else about it, clothes didn't, didn't do it, didn't matter. Mm -hmm. I had a design for that chic gal for the girl who wanted tall maybe, not even tall, just wanted flats or low heels. Mm -hmm. And I thought of her, I thought of, I thought of lawyers. I made a shoe, I have this, one of my most prized photographs is giving this shoe to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, <laughs> wow. She's about, I don't know how old she was when she died, but it was about three years before she passed away. She's being honored at the Supreme Court and through friends and my support of certain organizations, I'm there. And um, I had seen so many pictures of her in one of our mid-heel, like choked throat line, tight throat line pumps. It's very good fitting pump, but kind of cool looking with an oval toe. And she was uh, uh, administering the oath of natural citizenship to a hundred uh, people at the New York Historical Society Museum in New York. And my exhibition of my antique collection was opening there and my picture was on the bull board. Oh. And she said to the president, she said, oh, Louise, I wear his pump. She, she said, is it on display? No, no, these are his historical shoes, but we're, he'll be here uh, tomorrow. She said, well, I'll be back in Washington. She said, but if you see him, you tell him that that pump I love, why the heck doesn't he make it in red? Oh. I can't wow. find it anywhere in red. So I go to the Supreme Court with my shoebox. I get the security and they want to know what this is. And they yes. open it up, they see this red pump. I said, it's a present for... RBG. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they asked somebody in her party, it's okay. The guy comes over to me, I tell him the story. He said, let me see your table. And I give him my card. So I'm moving you. You're going to sit right next to Miss Ginsburg tonight. Oh my God! So my wife's somewhere else. I'm sitting next to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and uh, I said, I, uh, I'm sure all of us at the table want to know who everyone is. I said, of course, know who you are. I'm Stuart Weitzman. She said, I wear your shoe. Actually, look, I have your black one on now. <laughs> Why the heck don't you ever make this in red? You couldn't have. You couldn't have choreographed it better. Yes. <laughs> I said, well. I needed someone to inspire me to do that. And I opened the box and I said, it was you who inspired me. Oh, oh my God. God. She took it out and there's this photograph of her like a little girl getting so excited at seeing her shoe and she grabs it out of the box and she's looking, she kicks off what, you know how you would do that, yes. right? Like it is, kicks it off and puts on the red shoe. She said, I want royalties because you're going to sell a lot of these. <laughs> It was very funny, and I have a photograph of that. Oh, my god! <laughs> Your career so, spans 50 but don't years. But wait, that was in, don't think I don't think of women like that because we would sell hundreds of thousands of pairs to women over 60 who wanted it to feel good, look good, so it couldn't be this height. It, it, it had to be more like that height, you know, maybe um, an inch and a half, two inches at the most. Michelle Obama loved my nudist sandal, mm -hmm. and she said to me, I can't wear these heels. I'm, I'm not gonna try to compete with the gals who do. Why don't you make a beautiful sandal, not a dumpy looking mm -hmm. sandal, at a heel I can wear? 
and I made the nudist on a block heel, two and a, two and a quarter inches. She wore, never took it off. Listening I use it in my talk, actually. Listening to your customers. Her. Yeah. Key. So that my inspiration comes from the clientele also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not just the muses and not just my people in our industry who are not my competitive, but who have done some great ideas. Uh, or architects with their buildings and their et cetera. Uh, if you keep your eyes open and use your imagination, there's more inspiration than you can use. Absolutely. Your career spans 50 years. And, you know, as you're doing all these talks and you're meeting these wonderful kids and then, you know, that are going to take our place yeah. in the industry. They're inspiring. The overall stories that they kind of see with Stuart Weitzman is this great trajectory just upward. And we know as entrepreneurs, that's not exactly the case every day. What was your best day and what was your worst day? And what did you learn from those? You know something? The words ever and never and most and least, Yeah, they don't exist. Because okay. it's never the best and it's never the worst. It's, yeah. They're always the worsts and the bests, you know. And I can't tell you, like, what was my greatest shoe. Mm -hmm. I can tell you three or four great shoes. Um, and I can tell you a day or an, an occasion, an event that was very eye-opening to me. Yeah. Really depressing because of the reality of it. Uh, and challenging because it couldn't go on. Yeah. I was at a wedding. And you know, they sit you with your friends at mm -hmm. events like that. And I'm with four other couples in them all. One couple had a, his daughter with him. Um, and um, I didn't know her. So the polite thing is, hi, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Stuart Weitzman. What's your name? And she said, oh, I'm, uh, oh, she didn't even finish. She says, Stuart Weitzman. She says, I know you. My mother wears your shoes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Muhammad Ali just punched me in the stomach. That was not a pleasant response. Of course, I hope your mother loves our shoes and someday I hope you do. Sharp looking girl, Stanford University student, the kind of kid I was hoping was buying my shoes. Right. That's when I decided I had to solve it. And that's when I went after Kate Moss. Okay. And that's when I changed, not changed, added to my collection, which is a very important point. I was doing $250 million with her mother. Mm. I wasn't throwing that away, right? Right. Now I have to recognize that these new generations that we older folks joked about, oh, the X and the Z's and the what the hell are they, give them names, they existed. And they were real and they were the shoppers. And I had to attack, attract them to what I was doing. So Kate Moss was my vehicle uh, to show and the sh product had to be something special. And that's when I created the thigh high boots and the kneecap boots, the nudist sandal, mm -hmm. a super cool moccasin on a thick rubber platform with a block heel that was cool and young. Mm -hmm. Almost the same style her mother would have worn with a thin leather sole. But just the construction underneath it made it like, wow, this is attitude. Mm -hmm. And it doubled our business in four years. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So that was the worst day it was, but it was maybe the best day because it woke me up before I had already been asleep for too long. Interesting. So that That's woke smart. me up. Yeah. Yeah. They I say you retired in 2017. I can't see you retire. What, well, I, what this are you is my doing? second life. Yeah. Yeah. Here, it's my act two. But I still, I relive my career every other day. Yes. Yeah. I did last night, uh, it's Monday at Rice, Tuesday at UT, SMU on Thursday. Yeah. Tufts on the next week. I mean, I'm re always reliving my life, telling one of the different kinds of stories, depending upon who the student body is, you know, whether it's about design or leadership or finance or marketing or whatever. When you um, love what you do, it's hard to walk away, I would imagine. I don't want, I love yeah. doing this. Yeah. I did a few of these in a, throughout the years while I was still full-time employed, um, but now I do it as often as they call me up, they want me to yeah. do it. I want a Carnegie Mellon, I thought, what am I, why do they want me? So I looked up Carnegie Mellon. It's not so all high tech like you think Carnegie mm -hmm. Mellon. They have a great design school. 
a great innovation program, amazing entrepreneurship program. Right. And I called my friends at Penn, where I'm so involved, that I called the Dean of Wharton, Erica. She said, oh, Carnegie Mellon's a great school. That you, you should go there. If they've invited you, you should go. These things go on, you know? Yeah. At, at, at Washington University, how did I get to Washington University? I was speaking at Northwestern, and the dean there, right before I got there, is the dean here, now. And the new dean who heard my talk said, oh, you, I, I, you have to find out who this fellow Mazio is because you should be going, to, he'd love to have you at your school. And through a connection, I got introduced to Timothy and mm -hmm. others and, and here I came. So it just builds up, you know, because you get to know more people and I love it. Yeah. I put people in business because of it too. I have about 30 kids I'm continually mentoring yeah. Some fade off, some come in. Probably some kids, I, I said to the director last night, I said, if anyone wants my email, they reach me out. They have a reason to talk to me, not yeah. just to say hello or get a one an autograph. I'll be glad to help them with questions. And I put three people in the shoe business, all of whom are doing so well. It's wonderful. It's wonderful that you're now at a point where you get to share your, share your lessons. And I, yeah. I'm selfish. I enjoy it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. It, you know, I, it's not like, I mean, I remember uh, my father-in-law was a wonderful lawyer and a fine man. And I'm out to, took him out to dinner. Um, him, uh, his daughter, my wife, and me. And I took the check. And I said, no, don't worry. No, it's okay. It's, I'll be able to put it on the company. And he said to me, this isn't a business talk, son. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, you know, it's not that. He said, I, he said, I don't think you should think that way. And I said, you're too honest for me. <laughs> and he said, I don't think of it that way. And you shouldn't either. I don't want someone to know what I did and tell the IRS about it. So I would never do that just because I want to sleep at night. Think of it that way. Yeah. Ooh, was that a good lesson? <laughs> yeah. And every time I was, there, I'm tempted, I, I want to be able to sleep at night. Yes. Right. <laughs> so gosh. you learn things from a lot of people throughout life and you pick them up and you really have to grab onto the good ones. Mm. And if you do, then you'll have a wonderful life and you'll know how to, make friends with good people instead of hanging around people that only give you anguish. So I don't think it's that hard. And I try to tell the students it's not difficult. If you want, if you, the hard part is having a goal, know, know where you want to go. The easy part is figuring out a very cool and fun way to get there. The hardest part is the goal. So don't just take the easy path yeah. to that goal like, like nine tenths of the people do and you won't stand out. Do something in another way, engage other people to get there and it will pay off for you. You'll have fun doing it. You'll teach your employees to think that way also. Mm. Every talk I give, the, the, the ending of the talk, whether it's about business or design, is on the road less traveled. Thank you, Robert Frost, right. for that wonderful yes. poem, um, which I memorized in high school and it always struck me, his, you know, his last... Uh, the last line of that poem, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. It's wonderful. And it's so much better, mm -hmm. you know? I, I love that. I love that philosophy. You know, you've mentioned it a few times in our conversation today about, about really keeping yourself open for life's journey. Oh, keeping, yeah. keeping your eyes open no for blinkers. what inspires you. No blinkers. Blinkers are for horses, not for people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was I'll really wonderful it. to get a little bit more insight into what's inspired your journey. Um, and gosh, congratulations on a um, the success that you've achieved. And now uh, here you are able to share your story and inspire others who want to be the next Stuart Weitzman. I think they should be their next, whoever they are. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Not, yeah, don't worry yeah, about yeah, Stuart Weitzman. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Okay. Don't forget to subscribe to stay apprised of upcoming episodes of Clothing Culture. <laughs>